All right, so the technical definition of a waveform, it is a graph of the values of digital audio samples. But I gotta say, I barely understand what that means, and I actually even wrote that definition. So let's stop being literal for a moment. This here is a simple sine wave. And for now, think of this as a picture of how the speaker is going to move. Right? The high point of the waveform is the forwardest position. The low point is the backwardest position. How often it changes direction determines the pitch. Changing more often is a higher pitch. Less often, lower pitch. If I make the peaks bigger, it gets louder. And if I make them smaller, it gets quieter because the speaker is either traveling farther or not as far, but the pitch stays the same, which I got to say, that's kind of weird. So all right, this is a pretty helpful way to think of the waveform, but there's a lot of things happening in between this picture and your speaker. And those things matter in very practical ways. So for me, the most useful way to think of the waveform is as a picture of the amount of electricity we're going to send to that speaker. Positive voltage pushes the speaker forward, negative voltage pulls it backwards, and so on. If you were to send steady voltage to the speaker, the speaker cone would just move forward a bit and stay there. And it wouldn't make a sound because it needs to vibrate to make sound waves. Similarly, if you make the speaker move between a positive value and a different positive value, it still makes a sound. So here's a weird waveform from an analog synth I was playing with, and you can see it's insanely off-center, but you can still hear it. We can make the speaker play multiple frequencies at the same time by adding the frequencies together into a single stream of voltage. All right, this is easiest to visualize if we play one really low frequency and add a high frequency tone, which hurts. Sorry about that. Your machine is going to add these two together and send the result to the speaker, which looks like this. So you can see the voltage from the higher frequency is moving up and down quickly, and it follows along the wave of the low frequency. Now here's a more typical example. These two tones are relatively close together and the waveforms combine like this. The final waveform is messier, but it's the same principles. The voltages add up, the speaker is going to move forward, it'll move back a little, but not all the way to negative, and then forward, and then it'll do the same on the negative side. This works because that is basically what's happening in our ears. Different objects in the world are making different sounds, and these sounds, they reach our ear canals and they combine into a single messy and complicated pressure wave in our ear canal. And then our ears, with the help of our brain, can take this single waveform and extract all those different frequencies in real time. And because we have two ears, our brains can use the slight differences between the sounds they hear to figure out all kinds of other stuff too. But right now we're talking about a mono waveform in our equipment, and we're gonna leave it at that. A few more things to know about sound that aren't obvious. One, all sounds are sine waves. If you're thinking that you've seen pictures of wave audio waveforms and they aren't sound waves, well, that's because, two, you can create any waveform shape by adding up sine waves at different frequencies. Mathematical fact. And three, if you use technology to move a speaker without creating sine waves, your ears and brain will extract sine waves from it anyway. For example, white noise is an audio signal that's generated by throwing out random values. Right? There's not a sine wave in sight. Now, when your computer plays this, it will smooth out these angles. So you don't have these jagged edges for reasons we'll explain later. But these random values do turn into frequencies. In this case, it's an equal distribution of every frequency in our hearing range. Right? This isn't an auditory illusion. Like noise doesn't trick our brain. Right? In fact, like the frequencies that are buried in there, they are detectable while it's still in your computer. And you can even manipulate the frequencies. If I cut out all the frequencies above a certain spot with a filter, you can hear the difference. If I only let a band of frequencies through, you'll hear those frequencies. Here's another example. I'm going to use sine waves to create an inorganic waveform. If I add up a few specific frequencies, it sounds like this. And if I render the waveform, it looks like this. Notice that it's kind of starting to flatten out a bit. If I go even further, it starts sounding like an 8-bit video game. And if I render this so we get the waveform, 
this is starting to turn into what's called a square wave with pretty pronounced flat lines here. Here, we're telling the speaker to move forward quickly, stay there a moment, move back as quick as it can, stay there a moment, and so on. All right, so the square wave or pulse wave is a popular starting point for synths because it's easy to generate. You don't even need a computer chip to create an electrical signal like this, just some transistors and capacitors, etc. The main reason I took this detour is that there is another common way to get a flat line in your waveforms, and that is to exceed the limits of your equipment. Let's go back to the speaker analogy. Let's say that we're sending the speaker this signal, but the speaker can only move to, say, here and here. What'll happen is that the speaker moves to the limit, it stays there until the signal goes back to something in its range, and then it moves backwards, waits there, moves forward again, and so on. In the digital world, this is called clipping. Now, most of the time, you don't hear it caused by a speaker cone. Uh, instead, we normally hear it when it's caused by the recording equipment or amplifier, but it's the same principle. All right, so here, I'm going to bring up an oscilloscope here of this same sine wave. And then I'm going to use a plug-in to clip it. So if I add just, just a little bit of flatness, if I just chop off the tops just a little bit, it starts adding more frequencies. And obviously you can dive it deeper, and it changes the sound. Another name for this is distortion. A distortion pedal on a guitar is at its core flattening the tops of the sound waves. So here's a simple little guitar line. Here's that same audio with the distortion effect added to it. And if we compare them, you can see how it's flattening off these details. So that right there, it's got all those details in it. This is flattened off and it adds more sounds. You can see it again here too. Big bumps, just flattened out. Distortion can sound good because these flat lines occur regularly enough that it's the same harmonics every few cycles. Also gonna say avoiding those flat lines is why we have compressors, which is a big pile of weeds that I'm largely gonna skip other than to say that having a compressor turn the volume down and back up over time helps keep the waveforms from getting the shape deformed because deforming the shape of the waveform adds distortion. Now, understanding how changing the shape of a waveform will change the frequencies we hear, believe it or not, explains something else that I think is really misunderstood, and that is bit depth. It is not like increasing the resolution on your TV. Here's what is commonly explained. When you digitize an audio signal, a smooth analog line goes into your computer, which measures those voltages at specific points and turns them into numbers. Now, when it turns it into those numbers, it can only be so precise, right? And so the computer rounds it to the closest value it can. The amount that it is off, these are called quantization errors, quantization errors, something like that. All right, so far so good. But sometimes you'll see a drawing like this. And the implication is that the digital stair step gives digital audio some kind of harshness and a higher bit depth means a smaller stair step and therefore a smoother, more pleasant sounding sound wave. If this is how it was explained to you, put that out of your mind. Here's how bit depth actually affects audio quality. When you play back those digitized values, the computer reconnects those samples and does the math to smooth out the stair step. There is no stair step. But because these values had to be rounded off, it adds a little bit of wobble to the waveform. Right? When this wobbly waveform hits your ear, your ear does what it always does, and it extracts the frequencies. So it extracts the original sine wave, and what's left is the wobble. The wobble is more or less random, and like we said earlier, randomness becomes noise. Quantization noise is the technical term, and there's a bunch of math tricks that can be used to reduce the noise, make it less annoying, but in the end, digitizing audio creates digital tape hiss. Increasing the bit depth means getting more precise measurements of the original audio signal, which means there's less wobble. But it's still there, it's still noise, it just comes out as quieter noise. And that noise is the only real life difference between bit rates. That's it, for real. When you hear people talk about how 24-bit has increased dynamic range compared to 16-bit, this is because there's more room between the loudest sound that can be recorded and the noise floor that's created by the wobble. 
This means things can be quieter in the raw recording, and when you turn them up to a good listening level, you still won't hear that noise. One thing I want to say, though, is 16-bit is still really quiet. I think the number is like 64 decibels of range, and I've never needed to boost anything close to 64 decibels. And when I have had to do big boosts, it wasn't the quantization noise that was giving me grief. It was usually the room or perhaps the noisy preamps from the equipment. I'm not gonna say a bit rate doesn't matter, but you need to have good equipment and you need to know what you're doing to take advantage of it. To sum up, everything I've covered here really comes down to one principle. Our equipment plays multiple frequencies at once by combining multiple waveforms together into a single, complicated, wacky-looking waveform, and then our ears can separate them out again. The fact that they're combined inside the equipment is at the heart of so many technical tricks and troubles, like phase cancellation and comb filtering, why equalizers cause phase shifts, why compressors can cause distortion, especially on bass. But this also gets at one other thing that the internet often gets wrong. Audio is not like video. Video specs like resolution and frame rate seem similar to bit depth and sample rate, but that does not translate into how our brains perceive them. Right? The biggest difference is, is sound is change. The absolute position of the speaker doesn't matter, and the momentary air pressure in your ear doesn't matter. It's how those are changing that turns sound into, well, sound. So while you can cut out a single frame of film and look at it, there is no equivalent in audio. And in some ways, I think that's really cool, because sound is always moving. It's always going somewhere. Anyway, I hope you found this helpful, and uh, let me know if you want more of this stuff in the comments.